got to the cloud. Last time I did that, I recorded to the machine and ran out of space and lost it. Okay. <laughs> and that was the corporate training. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that went well. Uh, so, should we wait? Should we have, what should we do? Do you want to wait another couple of minutes? For any yeah, it's not half past yet, and that's the yeah. time you said. So, anyone that's going to be jumping in for the last second to do the registration and then get the link, it might yeah. uh, give, give them a the minute or two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John, by the way, how long is your talk? Is it still half an hour? Yeah. Yeah. Ish. 29 minutes. I'm <laughs> sure I can one trim minute. that. <laughs> to be I fair, we've got, it doesn't matter. If it overruns, it overruns. So I had thought about saying like, yeah, it doesn't, I just don't want it to be like a super, super, like an hour long. Like my first, one of my first ones was. <laughs> That's <laughs> fine, cool. Perfect. I'm oh, really excited. And I've got my pizza. I'm going to switch you to be the uh, host then, Jonathan. Ooh, power. Power. <laughs> Ooh, I can stop recording. I can. Oh, great. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, you watch, I'll accidentally click the button now. What else can I do? <laughs> I can make Alex disappear by the looks of it. Oh, yeah. You know. <laughs> that sounded really scary. I was thinking it's a bit like Avengers type. <laughs> um, apparently, Alex, how's your live typing? Because I can assign you to type closed captions. I would rather not, if I'm honest. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Someone else wants to do it for free. <laughs> Uh, apologies. I, I must apologise in advance. I'm going to be uh, having to leave probably at about eight, oh, so okay. it's, it's going to be no reflection on whoever's talking at the time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, well, no, that's so reassuring. Gonna get, hopefully, they'll get recorded, so you should be able to see whatever you missed at the end. Right. Yeah. 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 Great. Providing that, yeah, John doesn't turn it off. <laughs> Right. Hopefully I won't manage to hit that button. <laughs> the, uh, the first time I spoke at a conference, uh, Edmund, I got up, I was on the graveyard shift, last one for the, for the day, and about 50 people left. Because oh. they all had to catch oh, buses oh, and trains. Right. But it didn't make me feel very good, first ever conference. <laughs> yeah, venue especially if you didn't know the reason. What's the yes. Someone's got an oven. Uh, like, yeah, uh, sorry, that's my... I'll go and turn that off. <laughs> check out. Oh my god, is it me? Have I left the oven on? I've cooked my pizza. We're doing okay. We're up to about 14 people at the moment. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, so it's half past now. Do we want to start or should we wait a bit? I don't really mind. What do you give, it, uh, give it a minute, I think, yeah. for anyone that's clicking on it right now and just trying to get logged in. Yeah, I'll, I'll double check Twitter to make sure no one's harassing. Going, Where are, how do we get on? I, I hardly ever use Twitter. I do LinkedIn more. Mm. We've I got a slight recording of you eating now. <laughs> I look lovely when I eat. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm fully aware. <laughs> oh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't think this through. I'm not. If I'm honest, I might have turned the camera off. I was going to say I probably will mute myself because I don't. Probably people probably don't want to hear me eat. Um, actually, it's more confusing everyone, isn't it, when you're talking? I'm guessing. Well, it, um, we can't hear you eating. Oh, okay, that's good. Uh, right, let's see. And if I leave people unmuted, they can heckle as required without the soft fruit. So, um, right. We're really encouraging the heckling today, aren't we? <laughs> oh, absolutely. So now I find it a lot easier when you get feedback from people rather than talking yep. in a radio show. I've had to Even do four days the training, to the head. just four days of silence, and me saying, "Did anyone understand?" And someone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. No, no one seems to be. Oh. What have you done? Sorry, I, I took my camera away. Oh, okay. It doesn't need to be on if I'm going to put slides up. Oh, that's true. Oh. Um, yeah, so no one's uh, messaging anything. But yeah, have we got any more people? No, we'll wait a couple more minutes. It's fine. We've had one or two extra, I think. So, okay. five, six, seven, eight, nine, up to 16 now. Hmm. Oh, Someone who likes me on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, I think we could probably get started, Alex. I'll um, I'll turn my video off. back on later. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll turn my video off in a sec when I figure out how to. Um, I suppose you, you could do it for the intro, leave yours on for the intro and the talk. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So I'll do a quick intro for everyone now and then yeah, I'll turn myself off. Yeah. Uh, so hey everyone, welcome to our first ever remote code harbor. Hey! <laughs> Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for logging in. Uh, sorry that it was all a bit of a mad rush. Like I said, I didn't 
really think about this as an option <laughs> so i'm really sorry but we will be doing this again so yeah for anyone and we are recording them for anyone that didn't hear us talking earlier um so let's crack on so first off we've got ek services jonathan haddock who's gonna talk tell us about i didn't write it down <laughs> <laughs> For forensics and uh, giving that, evidence. That was so. it, thank you. <laughs> At least I hope so, because if I've got the wrong slides, it's going to be a very different talk. Um, <laughs> All right, thank you. Oh, away you go. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that title slide there. Yes. Excellent. Um, now, this is going to be a little bit odd for me because I'm used to wandering around and pacing while I talk, and now I'm constrained by a wire. So here we go. Uh, so good evening, everybody. I'm Jonathan as Alex has introduced, and we're going to take a look at digital forensics this evening. And this is all based on some work I did for the Information Commissioner's Office uh, back in 2018. So very briefly, a little bit about me. Uh, I've worked in IT for around about 15 years, just over maybe uh, now, and I'm presently the Deputy Senior Information Security Officer, which is an absolute mouthful but it means I look at information security incidents, be they data breaches or just a simple case of somebody has sent an email to the wrong place. And that's not always a massive problem, but sometimes it obviously can be. Previously, I've run pen test training courses uh, with the BCS and the YPSG is a group of them. And I've got forensics training along with penetration testing and incident response. So they all come together quite nicely for things like this. If I'm going too fast, folks, do throw a metaphorical brick at me because I can't see you, of course. So what is digital forensics? This is the process of looking at a computer system and some files to determine what activity took place. So much like we would do forensics on a crime scene to see what happened at a particular place, we can do that with a computer system. But it can also be about recovering data. So if anybody's ever pulled a memory stick out of a Windows machine, for example, without safely ejecting it first, you might have found that it's wiped your files, or perhaps the same with a digital camera, you've pulled the card out while it's still writing. And you've probably done some work there to get those photographs or those files back. And that in effect was also digital forensics. And in my day job, this is increasingly important because as we have different incidents occur, be that a data breach where we need to find out what happened or some malware has got in, we've got to do some forensics in order to actually find out what occurred so we can then learn from it, stop it happening again, plug some gaps. But it's not like it's shown in the movies where you sometimes have that lovely little counter and it says that it's decoding and decrypting the first letter of a puzzle and it carries on and on until right at the last second you would get the whole word or the whole access to the drive. It's not like that at all. Unfortunately, it doesn't look as pretty. Ooh, this does give us some challenges because sometimes you won't know what's happening until further down the line. Importantly, this isn't wet forensics. And by wet, I mean real world physical stuff. So we're not interested in blood pattern spatter. We're not interested in footprints or thumbprints. We're only interested in stuff in the digital realm. Does that all make sense so far? Because I can't see anybody. It's really weird. <laughs> Yes, it makes Ooh. sense. I'll be a it does indeed. Yeah, it does. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so part of being a forensic analyst actually can involve translating something that you're looking at. So the example I tend to use when I discuss this is something out of a web server log, which is this block here about the middle of this slide. Now, I quite often will get a request perhaps from a manager and they'll say, please could you tell us what my employee was doing on the internet on these times? If I were to just go and give them something like that, it wouldn't mean a lot to them. Now this log excerpt here is actually from a web server. Now I've anonymized it a bit, but it essentially tells us on the 9th of October 2018, a file was requested, the file had moved, so the web server sent a redirection request, which is that 301, it's an HTTP 301, and it tells us a few other bits of information, like what the user agent was, which was SimplePy, and you might see Chrome there or Safari or something like that. But if I just presented that as a piece of information to a set of managers when they had asked some questions, I'd be sent packing uh, and asked to go and do my job properly. So you've got a translation element to it. And that was really the big thing for me when it came to talking in court, which I'll get onto later. So I've covered what it is. What digital forensics is not is an instant indicator of blame. 
So it's not a case of I can look at a log and say, absolutely, I can prove that Alex went and did this thing. Because all I can see is that Alex's account did a thing. I've got no way to tie those actions to Alex, the human being. And that's quite an important thing to realize because it forms a caveat you have to put on every report you ever write, which goes along the lines of, we can only tie it to an account. So it's not an ind immediate indicator of blame. I've also put that it's not your fault as the forensic analyst. And the reason that's in there is because the first time you do an investigation, you can start to feel that whatever happens afterwards is, is down to you. So the first investigation I ever did was of a member of staff in a school and we had found some material on their laptop that shouldn't have been there, uh, some adult images. And I was asked to go through and find out what had occurred and what kind of images there were. Obviously, our concern was that there were going to be abuse images on that laptop. So I started going through to see what was there. It wasn't a nice experience. And fortunately, there was no abuse image. But early on in that investigation, I started to feel that actually, this person's going to lose their job because of me, which is a really horrible feeling. But the important thing is that if they are guilty and we can tie it to a person somehow, it's not me, the forensic analyst, that has cost that person their job. It is the actions that they have performed. And that's something really awkward to get your head around. And once you've sort of come to terms with that, you feel a bit better about it. Otherwise, you can feel a bit, whoops, I'm about to cost someone their job. So I've covered the fact that we can't tie those actions together. And we did have this come up at work. Uh, there was an incident where somebody was browsing the internet for things that they perhaps shouldn't have been doing at work. And what had happened was somebody had left the room and their colleague had done the browsing through their account. And it got to the 11th hour of the person who had left the room. They were about to go into the disciplinary essentially to get fired when another piece of evidence came to light, which showed that their door pass had been used to come back into the building, which assuming that that person always carries their own pass indicated they couldn't have been at the computer if they were outside. So because of that, it's, it's really important to have that caveat in there. So unless you've got a camera pointing at the user, their screen, their keyboard, you can't know as a friend's can list for certain who did what. And of course, the other thing that it isn't is easy uh, particularly these days due to encryption. And I'm not going to go into the ethics of whether or not encryption is a good thing or a bad thing, but it does add an additional complication for us as a forensic analyst because we can't just pull files off of a device anymore. So the process. You might get given a mobile phone or maybe a memory stick, a laptop to have a look at. Could also be a set of files. Uh, maybe someone has already taken an image and I'll come on to images in a moment. But once you've got those, you calculate a hash. And if you're familiar with things like MD5 or SHA-1, that'll be what you're using, or the, the later versions, to go and calculate a hash. And the reason we take the hash of the asset is so we know what the original looks like. We then take an image, we compare those hashes, and once we know that they are the same, we can make a copy of that, check that hash, and we can go on to do our analysis. And as part of that, initial receiving of the asset, we start our chain of custody. And this document is probably the most important document of all during your analysis. Because what it shows is exactly what has happened to the piece of evidence, to the asset. So your first entry is going to be that you've received some assets from somebody else. So you know where you've started. And then every single time something happens to that evidence, be that I perhaps show Ray the evidence I would put in there, Ray has seen it, or maybe I've given him a copy, that would go in there as well. Anything that happens to that evidence goes in that chain of custody. And that really is just there to show who's had access, what sort of access they've had, and to demonstrate that there shouldn't really have been any move, room for tampering. Because what you don't want is somebody to turn around later on, especially if you end up in court like I did, and say, well, you planted that evidence, you did this, this that, and the other. Now, clearly, you could lie, but there has to be some element of you're going to trust the analyst. So treat, treat this as the, like, the most important document, because even if you lose all of your reports, you can do your analysis again. What you couldn't do is recreate history. 
uh, without your chain of custody, you wouldn't know what happened. So anytime that asset moves, it goes in there. And ultimately this document is the one that protects you as an analyst and it helps maintain your integrity. And I was literally putting in my chain of custody, I've copied it from this server to that one, things like that. And the level of detail you put in is entirely up to you and whatever makes you feel comfortable. But from my perspective, it was really important to just give me some credibility and to make sure that I could demonstrate the right thing had been done. So I mentioned images and hashes. Um, there's an example of a hash here on the screen. Uh, it's about the middle, starts DA39, and that is a hash for a particular text string. I can't tell you what that text string was because you can't reverse engineer a hash. Um, and what it does is it takes the input, in this case, I used a text file, but it could have been a, a whole memory stick, and it runs it through some maths to determine a unique fingerprint for that object. And the important thing here is as soon as I change anything at all, be that say I've calculated the hash of a photograph and I change one pixel to be a different color, or I maybe crop the image or resize it or change the quality of the image. As soon as I do any of those things, that hash changes completely. So they're really handy when we come to copy a piece of evidence around, because we know that the source and the destination are the same, but also we can start using these as identifiers as well as file names. Because even if I rename a file, the hash will still be the same because it's looking at the content. So it can be a really helpful way of keeping track of things. You might also see these if you do any development work, your GitHub commit is, is a hash like that. But it's really important to have these in there because it proves what, you, what you're looking at. And you can see there I've noted a version. Whenever I'm writing a report, I will provide the versions of any tools I use. So I have included the version of the software I use to get my hashes, just in case there was a bug in a version so that someone can see what's going on. So, so Jonathan, a quick question there for you. Um, yeah, sure. would, you would you try and stay clear of SHA-1 at the moment? Because SHA-1, you can replicate a hash with a different can, source. Yeah. So would you prefer to stick with SHA-2, 256? Yes, I would. Um, yeah. The reason that for the work I did previously, uh, I had to use SHA-1 was because that was the only tool I had available to me. And I do come on to tools in a bit. What I did to try and offset that, possible collision issue because it definitely exists is I took an MD5 and a SHA-1 hash because the chance of there being a collision for both of those with the same sort of rogue file I consider to be quite low but yes absolutely I would try and avoid SHA-1. Oh it's all gone quiet have I lost you? No I'm still here thank you I still haven't <laughs> No worries hopefully that answered the question. Absolutely does yeah thank you. So we're obviously taking hashes. We've taken the hash of the original source media. We can also take a hash and we should take a hash of our image. And that's not just a photograph. Um, it sounds obvious. Oh, yeah, hello. Question in the chat. Hello there, go for it. I can't see the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, so from Matt, he's saying, do you include or exclude metadata from the hash, i.e. photo taken date? Um, because that is part of the file, that would be included in the hash. So if you were to go and change the photo taken date, your hash should also change. Cool. I'm assuming that answers Matt's question. Does that answer you, Matt? Feel, feel free to yes. shout at me because I can only see my slides. <laughs> so I'll if there's keep, a question I'll keep in the chat. I'll the chat and I'll shout out if needed. That's great. Thank you, Ray. Um, so we're taking an image uh, and this is a block by block copy. So you might use a tool like DD, which is quite prevalent in Linux and Unix, or you might use something like FTK Imager, uh, which is a free tool by the company that produced Forensic Toolkit. And the important thing about this image is it's not just a copy of the files on the disk, and I'll show you an example in a moment. And there are two advantages here. One, we can leave that original untouched. So the original source memory stick, phone, whatever we've got, we don't actually have to do any analysis on that. Once we've taken our image, we can lock that away and we should absolutely lock that away somewhere safe so that no one can tamper with that. Which is an advantage that we've got in digital forensics over wet forensics. If you've got a crime scene and someone walks into your crime scene, drops a biscuit wrapper or maybe plays with their hair like I do habitually and they manage to pull out a strand of hair, your crime scene's contaminated. Because we've got an image 
which we can copy as many times as we like and we can prove is the same each time, we've got an advantage because we can mess up and we can go back. Or we can give the files to someone else to do their own analysis. So we've got a real advantage here. And that's something that you can play on to make sure that you haven't made a mistake. If you think something's not quite right, you can go and redo your analysis again. Be wary of windows. Uh, if you're going to do any forensics work, it's not forensically safe. And what I mean by that is that when you plug a device in, Windows will try and make it available to you immediately and it will put a marker on that media. Now, it may not affect the data on there that you're interested in, but it will have changed something. So what you do is you use a tool called a write blocker and there's a photograph of one down at the bottom of the slide. And all that does is that goes between, in this case, the USB device and the computer's USB connections. And any time the operating system tries to write to the media, it stops that instruction. You used to be able to make these with IDE ribbon cables just by cutting a couple of the lines. Unfortunately, that doesn't work with things like SATA. You have to have a very expensive write blocker instead. So I mentioned it wasn't just a copy of the files on the disk. This is a couple of screenshots from a lab I set up for East Kent College, and they were given an image of a memory stick. And if they had just mounted that image so they could see the files, they would have seen the stuff that is on the left. So you can see obviously there's a Hunger Games theme going on here. There's a few other documents. And if they took that to be all of the evidence, they would have missed some of the things in the exercise. What we can do on our image is we can do something called data carving. So we can try and get back data that has been deleted or perhaps a previous version. And you can see the output from that on the right. So, okay, the file names have changed. This was done with PhotoRec, which is a free tool, but it doesn't unfortunately preserve all of the file names perfectly. But you can see there's extra files in there. So we've got PuttyGen and Procmon. Now, originally they were in the tools folder. So, okay, this particular tool you wouldn't want to use it for a criminal investigation, but it demonstrates things quite nicely. Though one of those files, if not both, were deleted on my source image. And I deleted them on the memory stick before I took that image. If they had just taken the, the memory stick as I had given it to them, they would have missed one of those files. So that's why we want to take an image, because we've got the whole history of the file system there available to us. Does that make sense? Have I done a really bad job of explaining that, or is that okay? No, that makes perfect sense to me. Cool. Yeah, I've got that. Excellent. Okay. And I've covered this already, so I'll jump over this slide fairly quickly. But because we can take a copy of that image, we can keep going and going and going. We can make a mistake or go back or give it to somebody else to perform their own analysis. But the important thing here, really, in terms of time, and time is money, is that taking an image and making it in the first place takes a lot of time especially if you've got a four terabyte drive that you need to take an image of. Once you've done it, just copy the original image file because you don't want to have to waste that time by doing it again from the original. And of course, if you have to go back to the original, you risk tainting your evidence. So I mentioned tools earlier on, uh, and there is a whole price range for these, including price available on application, which generally means that I can't afford it. So you've got tools like Encase or FTK, the Forensic Toolkit, uh, by Access Data. They're about $3,000 each. You've also got the Sleuth Kit uh, with its front end of Autopsy, which is open source. PhotoRec, which is what I showed the output of earlier. You can recover files with it, which can be really handy from that perspective. But sometimes you've just got to use the tools from your everyday applications. Now, in my case, um, the, the instruction I had received from the local authority was, please, can you have a look at the output from this person's mailbox and tell us if some emails existed before they were deleted, after they were deleted, you know, were they deleted, what happened to them? This meant that on the basis I wasn't going to be given $3,000, I had to use Outlook. So keeping an original copy of each of the files I had been given was an absolute lifesaver because it meant I could go back and check things. So here is a screenshot of autopsy. The advantage of a tool like this, rather than having to use your everyday tools, is that it pulls out so much data for you. So I wonder if I can put a, I can. So we can see down here, it's extracted some information 
from the data that we've provided. And that's really quite handy when you've got professional tools or the open source tools, because it can go and get that information and present it to you to save you having to do all the legwork yourself. But as I said, I had to use what I had available, which unfortunately for me was just Microsoft Outlook. So my relevant tool, unfortunately due to cost, came down that way. And then while you're doing that analysis, absolutely stick to the specification because it is an absolute rabbit hole to just start looking around. So I was asked to look between two date periods. I could have, given that I was in somebody else's mailbox, looked at all sorts of things. I could see in pictures they'd sent or emails they'd received that could have been sensitive information in there as well. And one of the important things to do is to just stick to what you're supposed to be looking at. Don't get distracted by the other files that are there. Not only does that mean that you can actually fit your work in the available time, but it, it upholds your professional values and your integrity because you haven't gone snooping around. And that's really important. When you're doing your analysis, try and avoid changing that copy as well. I know you can go back to your image, but it avoids any confusion that you might find. If you accidentally hit a key and change the state of an email, in my case, from read to unread, all of a sudden I can report that, yes, that person has probably seen an email because I can see that it was read, whereas that may not be correct. So really do your utmost to try and avoid changing whatever copy it is, be that an email database extract, in my case, a memory stick, a phone image, whatever. And while you're doing all of that, take notes because those notes are going to form part of your report and your statement. In my case, I had to write two statements for court based on two different bits of analysis. So I, take, I made a journal and then I extracted information from that to put into my court document. Importantly, you write your report for your audience. And by that, I mean, make sure it's written at a level they can understand. So it's not necessarily too technical because they are probably not technical people themselves, not write what you think they want to hear. Your job is absolutely to present the facts that you have found, the evidence that you've uncovered. You're not looking to try and ingratiate yourself with somebody else. So make sure it's not too technical. If you've got an appendix, if you've got space for an appendix, chuck that in there, include your list of hashes. So when you say you can look at this particular asset, it has this hash, someone can compare the two and see they're looking at the right thing. Potentially you're gonna to want to include your chain of custody as well to show that things have been done correctly. But this document is a need to know document because we have a, a piece of law in England that says you are innocent until proven guilty. And therefore, we want to make sure that we don't accidentally implicate someone or start gossiping because that will form a view in somebody's mind, especially if the newspapers get hold of it. We've seen that quite often. So because of that, we've got a duty of care to the prosecution, the defense, the jury, the judges to make sure that we've done things properly. And as I said, if that gets to the newspapers, you can ruin someone's life. I did work with somebody once who somebody did make an accusation of something they did eventually confess at court that they had lied but that person never worked again because the implications were so so far reaching of what they were accused of and that's why it really is important to keep it need to know we finally arrived at court i'm not doing too badly for time alex sorry um so this was the bit that i was quite worried about so when I took on the original job, I was told you may end up in court and I did the usual, nah, it'll never happen to me. And then I received an instruction to attend court. So you can't go in that courtroom before you've given your evidence, which means you're gonna spend a lot of time sitting around. In my case, the courtroom that I was due to be in was triple booked. So the magistrates were doing all sorts of things um, not related to my case. So I had to had to hang around and I had to wait. And there were other people in there that I couldn't speak to. So people from the Information Commissioner's Office that I had worked with for, by this point, months, but had never met were there, but I couldn't talk to them because then the defence can say, well, you're colluding. So we managed to exchange pleasantries. They'd travelled down from Liverpool. So we got as far as how was the weather. Uh, nice to meet you. And then basically we, we sat close to each other, but we didn't talk. When you're in the courtroom itself, uh, you'll find that you've got some barristers in front of you. They're the people that are going to be asking the questions. So when they're asking the question, you look at them so that they know that you've got that you're giving them your attention. But then in a magistrate's court, you turn around and answer to the magistrates. 
just because they're the people that are making the decision, they're who you need to direct the answer to. And it might feel a bit weird that you're not answering to the person that asked you the question, but that's expected. So it takes a bit getting used to, but it's okay. The best bit of advice I think I received when it came to talking to the magistrates was to watch their pens. And if they are struggling to keep up with what you're saying while they're making notes, you need to slow down. And it's interesting, I've started slowing down now because I'm reading this. You've got to slow down at that point because if they're having to write about what you said two sentences ago, they're not listening to what you say now. And that's really important because obviously you've got to make sure your evidence gets across. And importantly, make sure your phone is off. If it rings, you're in contempt of court, bad stuff happens. So my job was to give an explanation of what I had found. I was quite pleased that my technical evidence wasn't in question. So nobody said you couldn't possibly have done that right or you didn't find that. My job was to explain to somebody what it meant because these magistrates were lay people. They weren't forensic examiners. They didn't, as far as I know, work in IT. So I had to take them through my evidence. I was allowed a copy of that, which was given to me from the court documents. I couldn't bring in my own because I could have annotated it and been led as a witness by the prosecution. Um, so it has to be a completely pristine copy that they will give you. Uh, and then you can refer to things in that. But importantly, if you don't understand the question or it, you've misheard it, you can ask for that to be repeated or rephrased because the important thing is that you can give the right information across. Don't make stuff up. You're under oath at this point. So the first thing I did when I walked in was swear an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So you either found what you're being questioned on in the evidence or you didn't. That's all you can say. Yes, it was there. No, it wasn't. It happened on this date, according to the logs, what have you. If you don't know the answer, then that's the truth. So you say you don't know or if you can't remember, you can say that as well. But whatever happens, your answers are there just to clarify what you've already said in your statement. You're not creating anything new. You're just representing what's already there to add that clarity. The next piece I was worried about was cross-examination, because when you see it in the movies, the defense, if you're for the prosecution, tries to annihilate you, don't they? They try and character assassinate you as a witness to undermine your evidence. So I was really quite concerned about this piece. But the second good piece of advice I was given before I attended the courtroom was that if you just consider the cross examiners questions like any other set of questions, you're just going to answer them like there's no heat there. So that's what I did. And I had to clarify a few points. Um, there were some new questions and you can end up in a game of ping pong with one barrister then asking more questions following another one. Fortunately, it was only one round in my case and then the magistrates asked some questions of their own. Unfortunately for me, the defence then tried an assumption trap on me. And this is when somebody says to you, is it fair to assume that? So for example, I might say, Ray, is it fair to assume that the sky is blue? Now, looking out the window right now, I would say the sky was black. <laughs> but it's that assumption, and it's someone trying to use your credibility as an expert to lend your support to a tenuous idea. Now, I upset the defence at this point because I pointed out in a court of law, I didn't think it was fair to assume anything, which was not the answer that he was looking for. But we're not there to speculate. We are there to deal with the evidence. We either found it or we didn't. And then I'm nearly done, Alex, don't worry. Um, then we come on to reporters. There's going to be a reporter somewhere. You see it on the telly when you've got a big uh, court case going on and you'll see that there's a camera looking at the front of the courtroom. And although this was quite a minor case, that was going on. There were cameras outside of folks in the magistrates court watching the building. I've been looking at them all day while I waited to go in. But you might find a reporter in the waiting area. And in fact, there was one sat behind me. Um, the ICO and I managed to identify who they were because uh, they confessed <laughs> to the court clerk as they attempted to get themselves into a courtroom. They could be in the courtroom itself they could be just outside and they might be in disguise. And I'm not talking here a funny hat, a fake moustache and some thick black glasses. I'm talking quite a disarming sort of set of clothing. So I had somebody walk up to me in a high-vis yellow jacket holding a cigarette 
I assumed they wanted to ask me for a light, so I said I didn't have a, have a light, I didn't smoke. But it turned out they were probably a reporter because they then started asking me questions about things I had said in the courtroom. Now, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to talk to them about what actually happened in the courtroom because by this point, the case hadn't finalised, so I couldn't have that information go outside. So I explained that to them and they started to get pushy and they assured me that they'd been in the courtroom and they'd heard me say that email was stored apparently for 100 years and they wanted me to confirm if that was the case. Now, I don't know about you, if you see someone in a high-vis yellow jacket, you're going to spot them, public gallery or not. And the public gallery was in my eye line, so I could see this person was not in there, so somehow they got the information out of the courtroom. But that did mean that I had to say no comment a lot and then walk away. So hopefully that wasn't too fast. I appreciate them over time, so apologies for that. Are there any questions before? Uh, I think we've got a break after this, haven't we, Alex? Yeah. Any questions? Uh, so, got... yeah. I've... Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll ask mine first then. Um, you said uh, you were talking about uh, the forensic tools per case, like uh, you weren't going to get the budget for it. Do you get separate forensic tools for each case? Do you have to do a separate budget for each one? So in my case, because it's not my day-to-day -day job, I would have had to have treated it case by case. If this was something I was doing professionally day in, day out, then the organisation I worked for would have had one tool that they used. And then the only time that you would have a different set of tools, if you like, was if there was a new version that came out, at which point you've got to validate it and prove that it gets the same results as the previous time against a known good sample. But no, if you were doing this as your day-to-day -day job, you would absolutely have one set of tools. But if I want to do um, data recovery, I might not go and use a full thing like end case. If all I want to do is just go and get some data off a stick because I've lost it, I don't need to fire up a whole logging environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, so the question I had, um, as, as developers, what, what should we do to make sure that um, you know, we, we are logging the right information for forensics. So for example, you know, you talked earlier about if you encrypting a lot of data, then it makes it harder for, um, for um, forensics. But I mean, sometimes you cannot, you know, you can't stop that. But, but what is it that you look for within logs that perhaps simple mistakes that developers make that, that, that aren't logs that can be quite, you know, useful forensics? It's a good question. And unfortunately, part of the answer is you'll never have all the logs you want because invariably something that you want to see written down won't be there. Um, certainly if, if I was looking at a system where perhaps it was maintaining logins or data of that kind, it'd be really helpful to see a user ID, maybe an IP address and absolutely a date and time. And if there's multiple components in an environment, that time has got to be synced because you need to be able to show that you've definitely moved from system A to system B not the other way around. So time is really important. So as developers, making sure that you've got at least a timestamp in there is really, really useful just for building that timeline as what has happened. And as soon as there's users involved or maybe access to a particular location, putting that sort of information in there, think of it as a journey. If, as a forensic analyst, I want to be able to walk myself through history to see what has occurred. If I can't do that, or if you couldn't do that with the system you're developing, try and work out how would you demonstrate. It's a bit like debugging a program. How did I get from point A to point D? Did I go via B and C or did I go B, F, D? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, so the other thing I was also thinking about is, um, you know, from a security perspective, you, an attacker probably would want to try and forge the log to some degree. So you'd probably want to put controls in around log forging, I guess, as well, to, to make sure that the, the log's integrity is maintained, um, yes, e absolutely. even while it's been recorded. <clears throat> uh, there are a few tools for that. Uh, if you can get your logging off box, that's, that's a good start, because if an attacker manages to break into, say, I don't know, your, your web server, one of the things that's quite usual for them to do is to go and erase the log of the machine they've arrived on. If that log data has already gone off somewhere else that's immutable, they can't obviously get rid of that. They might then go and put in a dodgy entry that shows something happened three days ago, but the remote system would actually show in, in terms of sequence numbers, 
that March the 1st, 2nd, 3rd was then followed by an entry for February the 29th. And that would then obviously be a problem. But you're absolutely right. The integrity of logs is really important. And when we're looking at cybersecurity, we've got the CIA triad, which is nothing to do with the American uh, services. It's confidentiality, integrity and availability. And your logs fall into at least integrity, probably confidentiality and certainly availability. If your logging source isn't available, things start to look a bit shaky. and You've got to go and get information from elsewhere. I think some people also put the T into that as well. So trust also forms part of the CIA, CIA trilogy. Yep. Which we had. So tr yep, trust, I guess, trust is it. another factor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> really good what? questions, folks. <laughs> Yeah. I was just wondering, um, when you were sort of taking imaging of, um, say, a directory, will you include, like, um, I'm assuming you would include shadow copies with all of the data that you're recording so you can see, like, at some point where the files changed? Yes, you would. So you wouldn't normally take an image of just a directory. You would take an image of the entire disk that's got that directory on it. So that would then include okay. those shadow copies or any previous versions that have left traces on the disk so then when you data carve if you say your disk is two gig let's go small when you data carve you're going to get back more than two gigs worth of data if that disk was okay strong. so what in that case what how did you how would you deal with a situation where you've got say um a raid array on a server um where you've got parity across all of the the disks and not necessarily um one physical disk would you, would you just take the partition itself that's a good question and in all honesty i don't entirely have the answer to that one you would have to take an image of the whole array certainly to do it properly um i've never had to do it on a raid array so i'm I was sorry gonna say, I that's got to be quite a sizable one. task it, it can <laughs> you know be. if you've and got like commercial um servers and they've got like i don't know 100 well terabytes and terabytes, terabytes of, of, data, uh, yeah. of data yeah and of course, the other problem is while you're imaging it, it's offline. So worst yeah. case scenario, the guy that did my problem, forensics yeah. training, um, he had been involved in a forensic case where he had literally walked in with a warrant to the customer, the, the person they were investigating's premises, walked into the data center and gone, I'm having that lot. <laughs> now, unfortunately, that meant that business died. But yeah, because they, they had I mean, no comeback. In some businesses, yeah, um, it, it literally can be just, you know, a small amount of time can make a huge difference in, yeah. in some businesses. Absolutely. So yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have the full answer to that question, but I might have to look. No, up no, it's, it's, that's alright. I just thought I'd, I'd dig until we reached the end of the tunnel. Yeah, no, good question. Thanks, John. <laughs> that's alright. Uh, anyone else? No. Uh, okay, I think that's it then. Um, so what do we all want to do? Do you want to take a five minute break or 10 minutes? I don't really mind what we do. Um, anyone got a preference? It depends on how much of the presentation we still have to finish. Well, that's the, well, that's the thing. It doesn't, <laughs> it's going to finish earlier than it would have done if we were at the uh, quarter house anyway. So we can kind of do what we want. What do you want to do? Would you like five minutes or 10 minutes? I'm going to ask um, you, Ray, because you're, you're on, so. <laughs> we can do a five minute. My talk, I don't think, is going to be as long. Okay. So we'll come back at about quarter past then. Is that all right? Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, John. I'd, I'd clap, but that seems a bit weird when I'm on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm pleased that was useful. It was. It was amazing. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we'll be back on uh, about quarter past. Yeah. Oh, yep. I guess we're all just going to mute ourselves, aren't we? <laughs> Jonathan, can oh. you switch the uh, host back to me? Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm just doing that now. Brilliant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm going to mute myself and yeah, we'll talk in a couple of minutes. Thanks, guys. Brilliant.
Well, that was a great talk. Thanks, Jonathan, if you're still there. I'm still here and thank you very much. That's really, uh, really kind. Feel free to leave your microphone on for me if you want, if you want to read the chat or... Uh... Yeah, well, I can do that if you guys want. I don't mind. Yeah, that'd be great. Sometimes yeah, I was doing it anyway. <laughs> having a, a wing person who can kind of respond when you say, is that clear or am I muted or... <laughs> yeah, God, what have I done? Where's that? <laughs> That's oh, I've broken it. Hang on. <laughs> What's happened? You can see you and hear you still. So you can all hear me then? Yes. Can you all see me? Exit. Ah, there we go. Sorry, it went on to minimise for some reason. I couldn't get it back. Cool, we're all right. Um, by the way, guys, I don't know if anyone else noticed this. Um, there's a way for you guys to raise your hand through Zoom. Yep. So I just thought that would be, an, why, maybe that would be an easy way of doing it. If anyone wants to do that instead, rather than have to shout and hope we don't talk over each other. Um, well, it's either that or just type in the chat. Yeah, uh, that works. Yeah, it's just it's easier like if, um, if you're watching, because if you're talking and focused on what you're talking about, you don't always see the raised hand. No, the but I was looking at the whole time, so I was kind of thinking, if I'm just sat watching it, I can sort of say, oh, this person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of up to you guys what you want to do. If you want to type in it, or I'll be looking at it through the whole thing. Uh, I think I'll pop out. Yeah, so I've still got it here, so I'll see. Uh, oh. Are you okay for us to interrupt you, though, if we do have a question, rather than put a hand up or... Yeah, you Quite, jump in whenever. Yeah. I don't mind. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I'm used I'm to quite... live training with real people, so. Um... Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I guess you are. Not real people. <laughs> yes, but in a, in a room where you can see someone kind of put their hand up or kind of cough in a certain way or yeah. answer the phone and walk off. <laughs> if you cough in a certain way today, it could be a completely different reason. Yeah. I'm not going down that route. It's recorded. <laughs> Uh, so should we should we carry on? Level? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone with the toilet. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're going to move on to our next talk. So I'm really sorry, uh, Ray. I can't pronounce it properly. Eruditology. Eruditology. I tried so hard. I've been trying the last 24 hours to try and get it right. Uh, so that that company's <laughs> uh, Raymond Colstock is going to talk for us now um, <laughs> on treating your career path and training like leveling up in games. So where you go. Yeah. Oh, good evening. I think you've all heard me talking anyway. I'm Ray Colstock. Um, I, uh, it's my company, Erudiology. Nobody can pronounce the name. It doesn't matter. I'm sticking to the name. <laughs> um, I did a talk, I think it was last year at Code Harbor, talking about how to uh, 10 times your speed of learning, how to learn faster. Um, so there'd be one or two slides in the middle of this training relate to that. Oh, that on. Yeah, the sound of the sea, the Arcode Harbour. I think that'll be uh, John Murray, I think, possibly. No. What's this? Oh, okay. There's it's a microphone that I can hear rustling away. Uh, some, yeah, someone's, someone can hear the sea or something. And anyone yeah, else? Oh, yeah, stop now. Okay, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so there's a little slide about me. All trainers do that. Um, so I've been teaching uh, for around 20 years now, a number of different countries um, and a number of different platforms that I, I deliver training on. Um, so the talk today, I want to talk about treating your career kind of like a game. Um, and I feel this is kind of the right audience for that. So I've got a, a snapshot here. I, I took a picture of a game, the case I've got on my desk from, uh, I was looking at the date earlier, I think it's 2002, <laughs> called Star Trek Bridge Commander. I was basically looking for a game that had a great silhouette of a, a character or a person on, and this turns out to be perfect. So the idea of you are the hero of your own story. You are improving the, your skills and your career step by step, but you're, you're picking uh, an end goal that you want to get to and how to reach that goal. Uh, so a little bit of an agenda. Um, we're going to go through how to pick a target or making sure you pick a target. We're going to pick a route to get to that target. 
we're going to recognize your ideal way of learning and that's or your ideal way of training and that's the little bit that that one bullet point is what i did a previous talk on so we'll only cover that briefly um, and then we'll go into how to find your ideal training and then towards the end i i'm going to announce a new piece of software that i'm making public and available today as well kind of a shameless plug at the end only a little bit alex that's okay <laughs> <laughs> so um I did copy this. I didn't draw that. I've put the hyperlink at the bottom for copyright protection and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I grabbed that one off the internet. So targeting your, the final job you want to do, do you want to be a, the captain of the ship? Do you want to be head of engineering? Do you want to be head of science or medical? Um, does anyone know which Star Trek edition that came from? Oh, uh, next Sorry, gen. PNG. Yeah. Next gen. Yay. Picard and the crew. Um, Without Picard. Sorry. <laughs> it could be. It's bold. Yeah. Oh. Uh, didn't think of that. Oh, and that could be data as well. Um, so, yes, you, you need to identify where you want to go with your career. And it may change, but do you want to be a technical director of a Silicon Valley company? Do you want to be the head of forensics for the Met Police, maybe? Pick a target of where you want to get to. And then based on where you want to get to, ultimately, you want to be rich and retired, I'm guessing. And you're going to start off as a, that's not really a student, that's more of a baby, but it was the nearest I could get. Um, which route you're going to take to get through that. So I've got to start there, junior developer and junior web, de junior web designer. So more on the design element. And then when you go from a junior web designer, use my little pen. Do you move to a uh, web developer? So you've gone from CSS, HTML, and Java, the little bit of JavaScript, do you move heavily into JavaScript? Or do you move over to being a full stack developer and learn more? Um, if you're Microsoft stack, maybe back end C sharp, maybe ASP uh, and, and SQL. Or a senior developer with a little bit of team leadership responsibility responsibility in there. I've seen over the years where companies tend to blur the difference between senior developer and full stack developer. There are many full stack developers that are senior, but generally in the, in the job descriptions and the way I've seen it used is that senior developers have some element of uh, responsibility or they have some, they are listened to more from the rest of the team or management. A full stack developer could be really experienced but have very little um, uh, people skills and so you might have lots of uh, technical experience but you're not necessarily a uh, project manager or, or team leader in any sort of way and so a full stack developer might move over to a consultant where you're doing six months year or a few months a, a, a client and move on but you have a, a wealth of technical experience and years of experience or you could go down the route of technical director and you're leading a company but at that point then you're, you're looking more at soft skills and management and and working with the board so if you identify the route you want to take to get to your end goal whatever your end goal is you then need to do a little bit more work on finding what skills each role along your chain has or needs to have so for a junior developer, this could be an example. I just pulled this off the internet uh, earlier today. You can see that person is a junior developer, is probably looking at charts for, for management with the Excel and the Power BI. So they need to know a little bit of SQL, some exposure to C, but it's all basic level stuff. Then moving on to the full stack developer, still looking kind of in the Microsoft world of things. So good knowledge of C Sharp, .NET Core, Web APIs, just knowing SQL, not just an experience of SQL Server. And then going into some of the, because it's full stack, you go into some of the front end design of the HTML, JavaScript, the Angular, and some knowledge of Agile, and some knowledge of Git. But the key here is, if you're going from junior developer and you want to become a full stack developer, there's no use just applying for the jobs. You need to get these skills before 
you apply for the job. So while you are a junior developer, you've got to be targeting your next job and learning the skills ready for it. So learning the skills and getting some form of evidence of the skills. So either you've got a certificate or you've worked on a project that has those, and it might be as a junior developer, you get an opportunity to work on projects with these and learn them from somebody more senior. And then you can add it to your CV ready for when you want to become a full stack developer. And the same for if you want to make the step up to management or technical director, you have to identify the skills needed. And while you are a full stack developer, learn those skills or get an opportunity to have evidence of those skills. And you can see it goes from having lots of technical knowledge to you've just got some sort of strong programming skills. And I've interviewed and spoken to many technical directors who happen to know a completely different language to what the rest of the team know. I've known teams running, um, I've known technical directors who are in charge of teams who do C sharp, but the director used to do Perl or Ruby. And they'll say, I programmed years ago, but I haven't touched it for, for a long time now but I know what it's like to be a developer. But they need to know architectural patterns and team management. It's the, it's the big umbrella skills that they need to be having. Be able to liaise with management and all of that sort of stuff. So we've, we've looked at identifying where we want to get to. We've looked at the route to get there. We've got to find the skills to get us there. Now, how do you get those? How do you find all of this? Well, just crawl the job sites. I've put some there. There are loads of others. Just go on there, look for the target job you're aiming for and the steps in between and go and find the skills that they need. Now, some of the skills will change over the time if you, if you think looking five years or 10 years ahead, but some are, are, are going to stay. Strong programming skills, timeless. Uh, there will be new versions of .NET Core, but once you know it, whether it's version one, two, three, there's only slight changes. C Sharp again, you'll get versions of it. JavaScript is JavaScript, but there will be new additions to it. So learning the principles of anything is useful. So you can go and find the list of skills you need for each job. Then you need to take a good, long, hard, honest look at your own skills and where you are right now. Um, and we've got a really simplified version of a possible CV here. Obviously not mine, because I'm not a graphics designer. Um, but if I was, so it could be that I'm, I'm pretty strong in Photoshop and I'm weak in all the others. I put myself as a level three. Um, and then based on where I am now, I could do a little chart. Well, this was a concept of a chart that we did with the team. So I'm strong in Photoshop, that's a level three, the rest are all level ones. That gives us a sort of, in marketing terms, this would be a, a persona or a profile of a person. We can then use this to map it and match it with various job roles. So here's an example of, on the left-hand side, we've got a persona map for somebody as a JavaScript developer. So we're saying that for a JavaScript developer, we need JavaScript at, uh, it's at the fourth ring. And we need agile software development at the first ring. But generally from looking at these maps, if you end up filling up a lot of the map, you need to have a lot of those skills. If you only fill up a small portion of the map, then you need the skills weaker. So the more that you can see covered up with that area, the more of those skills you have. So we're saying we need somebody as a JavaScript developer, as a job description, that needs to cover a lot of those roles. And the person we're looking at at the moment has a map that's slightly smaller, stronger in some areas, the stronger C -sharp, uh, CSS rather, and the stronger HTML, but it's much weaker on Angular and much weaker on, on SOAP. Although I'm not sure we really need SOAP web services for a JavaScript developer, but it proves a point for the chart. We now have the target of where we're trying to get to. We now know the jobs that are going to take us there. And we know a skill map for each job and where we are now. So then we've got to look at how to get the skills. 
Now, this is uh, related to the talk I did last year. So if we're trying to find the skills that are right for us and the way of training that's right for us, it should be easy. As easy as that guy's making it look. Um, hopefully he's not throwing something at the trainer when the trainer's looking the other way. Um, again, there are lots of places to go and find training. There's a bit of a mix on here. Some of them are, a lot of them are videos because I tend to use a lot of video training for me. Um, some of them are audio books, uh, some of them are blogs, and, and there are loads of other out there. Can anyone spot the odd one out? Yeah. <laughs> I'm liking Starfleet Academy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sticking to the Starfleet thing. I want to know how to enrol. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's, a, there's a wealth of training you can get out there. Um, now, from a practical point of view, if you want to go down this and, and do this for yourselves, you can build a sort of grid to identify how you like to learn. So going from left to right here, we've got, do you like videos? Do you like books? Do you like uh, listening to a lecture or training, kind of what we're doing now? Do you like listening through audio books maybe, or podcasts? Do you like practical activities? So I've a guy coding, um, or do you like group discussions? And at Code, Code Harbor, we get a mix. We often, uh, over the beer and pizza, we have a mix of discussions. We see some, we listen to someone talk, and we see a presentation. So based on this, you would tick off the areas that you, how you like to learn. Now I'm willing to pay for subscriptions, so I've got a little tick down here for me. Uh, and I do subscribe to Audible, so I like that one. Um, I don't necessarily pay for training myself. I don't subscribe to discussion groups. So you can, you can tick through how you like to learn. And this is my map for me. So based on how I like to learn and based on knowing the, uh, the marketplace for training out there and which ones of these are paid for and which ones are free, you should be able to identify what training you need at different times. So we're using our little map of how you like training. You know what skills you have, so you know which skills you need to find next. So if you're looking at becoming a junior developer, I would recommend people looking at YouTube and tree houses as easier, cheaper options. When you're going from junior developer to senior developer, Pluralsight and Code Academy are good, although uh, Pluralsight is definitely paid for. I'm not sure about Code Academy. And then when you're moving from senior developer to technical director, Pluralsight won't help a great deal because that does a lot of, um, it's great for coding, but it doesn't teach you soft skill like uh, budgeting, team management, anything like that, which you can get that from LinkedIn Learning because uh, Linda used to have it before LinkedIn Learning bought Linda. And you can read lots of audio books or listen to lots of audio books on Audible obviously Amazon for buying the books. So we're identifying different places to learn based on how you like to learn, based on the skills you need at different stages of your career. And so this is uh, the bit where I'm, I'm announcing the tool that, that I've spent a few years making because I've done lots of jobs of training lots of people and having to coordinate and manage their training. So. It's a tool to help you pick your target job, find the skills you need, and find your preferred training style. So the site is called findjobskills.com. Um, it does have a custom uh, Google search filter built in there. So on one of the pages, you can, you can type into the website looking for uh, Java, and it will go and search, it will use Google search engine, but only a limited amount of the internet. It won't just search everything. It will search training websites to save a bit of time rather than coming back with someone who's named their dog Java and has got into the news. It has a list of job roles on there and you can add new ones. It will have, it has a uh, preferences questionnaire. So it's that bit of, um, it has that bit as a web page in there, so you can go through and tick it. And of course, you can update that at any time. Un unlike uh, Netflix and Amazon, that when they think you like horror movies, it's locked in. Uh, with this one, you can go back to your, your training preferences at any time and update it. 
and it will give you a personalized route to find your training and it's got a little bit of logic in there to recommend training based on the jobs you're targeting your learning preferences and the skills you already have i'm going to i'm not going to spend too long on this but it's a few screenshots of that so there's the the grid that you can use to pick um, and then it gives you a bit of a CV and your learning preferences. And actually, there's a there's an interactive chart, which is the uh, it's that bit. That bit, I did a, a screenshot of the actual website. So you get a little drop down below the left hand one. And you can choose which job role you want to compare yourself against. So you add your, your skills in that you have and it will give you a comparison. And based on that, it will then recommend training for you. Sorry, and um, what was the name of the site? The name of the site is Find Job Skills. Thank you. That looks really cool. Thank you. I've been working on it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly because I was working for a company, I was running the training for 300 people. Some working on networking, some working on email. And the email team was saying, we watched these videos. It was great for us to learn. And the networking team did the same thing. And I was just forwarding emails from one group to another. I thought I could make a spreadsheet for this. No, hang on. I'm working for a web company. Let's make a website. Um, <laughs> so that's where it came from. Um, but that's, that's the easy bit all done, deciding where you want to get to, to find the training and mapping it all out. You still have to make time for yourself to train. You still have to find the jobs to go for, or whether it's even a promotion in the same company is a bit easier. And then you still have to breeze the interview. Just because you're listing out that you have these skills doesn't prove you have them. A good interviewer will have to find that out. This is like LinkedIn. You can fake your LinkedIn profile and say, you, you know how to launch a rocket to the moon. An interviewer still has to prove it. Um, so we do have a team of aerodiology of uh, trainers and teachers. Um, and we can help with things like reviewing CVs. As I say, I've, I've interviewed hundreds of people over the years. Um, and most teachers or trainers will interview 30 to 40 students every year at a college. So they've been through lots of these. Um, we can build training plans. We can do skills analysis. Um, and a little snapshot of what some of those include, a good um, teacher or trainer who has gone through um, training how to be a, a teacher and done a bit of psychology and neuro-linguistic programming will use some questions like this or just listen to how people talk to get a feel for somebody's learning style. When you're in a live class and you're watching a, um, a group of students, you're watching body language and mannerisms automatically to try and pick up on this. So some of the questions like, uh, if you find yourself always asking questions like, do you see what I mean? It could mean you're a visual learner. Or if you say, do you hear what I'm saying? Could mean you're, you prefer listening to learning. Or things like, uh, do you follow the process? Did you follow the process that I was talking? It means you're very process orientated, step-by-step -step instructions. Maybe you're sat there with lots of questions and actually you learn by asking questions. So this is something that, that teachers and trainers tend to do naturally after years of practice. So having a session, uh, uh, you know, a half hour or 20 minute talk with a trainer, they will give you a strong indication of what your learning style is. Failing that, you fill out a grid and that can give you some idea. Um, we're almost getting to the end of my talk now. Uh, a future talk I'm planning to do at uh, Kent Digital will be what we've looked at so far is actually identifying the skills for one person. You then need to be able to scale this up for the whole team. So I had to do this for a team of 300. I've done it for larger teams. Um, and even for small teams, it's, you know, going back to the Star Trek idea, just because you've got a great captain doesn't mean that the rest of the crew are any good. You need to train the whole crew. And the same with the band and the same with the sports team. The whole team need to be good. The whole team need to be trained. Um, that brings me to the end. Thank you very much. Um, and if you do want to find me on LinkedIn, there's a QR code you can scan on your LinkedIn app.
and some hyperlinks, my email and, and some websites. Any questions and, and over to Alex? Yep, uh, yeah, anyone got any questions or wanna raise the hand or shout at us? <laughs> well, the question I was gonna ask was how do you determine where you're going? And then you'd written a tool to do it. So <laughs> it's a redundant question, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's the, where, you, where you want to go is, um, is your choice. How to get there is what the tool can help with. True, yes. We can't really pick for you um, whether you want to be a manager of a football team or whether you want to be a chief fire officer. <laughs> I can guarantee the football team decision would be a bad one in my case. Yes, yeah, same for me. <laughs> That's why I went with generic slide of a foot of a sports team rather than naming any particular one <laughs> <laughs> don't bet me i wouldn't know any names <laughs> yeah uh, um uh, anyone else so, so ray looking at your uh, fine job skills website are you looking to expand on the number of job roles you have there yes i am <laughs> it's small yeah. at the moment yeah yeah i'm going to be adding lots more in but there's um, the role, the job roles can be a crowdsource as well, so anybody can add them in, and then anybody can vote on them and, and add skills to them. So the idea is we could get a hundred web developers and get an, the opinion from a hundred web developers about what the important skills are for a web developer. I've got a quick question, um, just out of interest, because obviously I've, I haven't really looked on the site. Um, are there a quite? Is it quite broad? Like, what kind of jobs are on there? Is it mostly going to be like dev stuff that most of us would do, or is it? It's mostly dev stuff at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. But yeah, it's oh, a tool, <laughs> so it could be used by anybody. But at the moment, I've I've put stuff on for dev, and that's what my team are going to be adding a lot more on over the next month or so. Is that? So is it just dev, when I say dev, so I mean like, is it like I, the whole of IT? So do you get like support stuff as well, or is it mostly like Cody stuff? It'll be digital. It'll be. Oh, okay, cool. It'll be tech stuff. So for for software oh, companies. Quite, quite wide, really. For yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, anyone else? So, so I, I, I'm I'm not sure if I missed it or not. Did, so how, the recommended skills that you have for each job role. Yeah. How, how do you determine those? I type them in at the moment because I saw them on job descriptions. Oh, I see. So you are looking at job descriptions and then. Like picking out the skills that are mentioned in those job yes. descriptions is, yeah and would you then perhaps create like uh tests around these because obviously people can lie about their cvs um they can't afford <laughs> and so forth so so would, would, the, would you also like uh go through some sort of like uh i don't know like like a, a pretty intensive test that then sort of tells you what your ideal job should you know should be based on your current skills and where you can go from that so yeah i i saw i i have got a few ideas for a tool for that but i you know that's halfway in development so i'm not really going to announce that one but okay. um, <laughs> i've certainly been through um in interviews where i've had candidates in and the upper management have said to me we've got 11 jobs open in different departments can you just interview per this person and don't tell them what the job is can you work it out during the interview i've certainly had to do that um and you can, I mean, that's where the human element comes in. When you talk to somebody and they say, I know a lot of CSS, I know a lot of JavaScript. Oh, I've never done any security. Or someone says, I am a security expert, but the, the, the total of their knowledge is you've got to add a password to a website. Then you decide maybe they're not a security expert. But yeah, there, there's, I wouldn't, I would never recommend a tool like that to say, this means you can do the job. This is a tool for the individual to help you. If you lie on it, you're only a problem for yourself. This isn't necessarily a tool for, for a business to say, well, you've got full marks on that. That means you can do the job. The interviewer still has to find that out. They sort of give you a kind of rough idea of the kind of roles you should be going for. Is it that kind yes. of? If you're honest, this will help you. <laughs> <laughs> is that all? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're just actually, sorry, I'm, I'm just taking over and asking all these questions. Uh, I'm just curious, is it, like you said, obviously it's still quite a small like data set that you're using at the moment. Is it, does that, you're saying it's obviously, it's for, like, it's, you know, it's digital. Is it for, say, people that have got 
say probably the majority of the people here have got a bit of dev experience or is it from, could it be from people that say going straight in that are quite new maybe know a little bit of css and want to like what kind of level is it kind of targeted at, at the moment so if you look under the resource links if i um that one um if i share it on my screen that's a that's a google search so you could type in for javascript um, and that will search the whole of the uh, basically the whole of google for only certain sites that i've recommended oh i see youtube plural site edx coursera and the like and linda so it's not going to do the whole internet search but it's searching training sites yeah uh, and, and the profile you've got the job bowls there isn't much there uh there, there's i mean it's only newly gone live so there's not a lot of data in there at the moment yeah but even with the skills i've gone down the route of skills can have sub skills and so it can all be mapped and tied in um and the profile bit you can have uh, your skills you can go through and add new skills in and remove them and say what level you're at your learning preferences it's, it's kind of uh, big data and just and also what what teachers do naturally in their heads i've put into a tool so you get like a, how compatible you are with job roles what skills you have at the recommended ones and then even with the training plan we can go down the route of uh, what training you want to do in what order um, and based on the skills you have we can click this and get recommended training you should do at whichever level wow that's really cool um, and then kind of a new section in the last month or so has been uh, a cv with the uh with this map in there so you can compare yourself to different mm. jobs but it only shows on the right hand side the skills that are relevant to this job so although i've got a, a massive long list there that i've put in some of it's just for me to to test um it will only show so this one's got java groovy and javascript if i go back to the java developer the groovy disappears because it's not needed yeah. oh, okay. hmm. yeah sorry i'm just i really like the maps they're really cool <laughs> <laughs> the map is quite cool yeah. yeah and i'm kind of jealous like oh i wish i could have built that it's looks cool um so yeah has anyone else got any questions I yeah, I was going to ask, um, with all the uh, CV skimming software at the moment, um, is there anything built in in order to kind of uh, prompt the keywords that may not be necessarily included in a CV or sort of, you know, um, kind of nudge people towards using the kind of terms that um, that sort of software would skim for? Um, I haven't put it in to work for uh the, the skimming software in that way i do do some recommendations when it comes to uh, to other bits so um one one part of the site is where you can actually upload uh so if something's not in google you can upload something to my built-in search engine and it will read the description to try and work out whether it's what the training is for and what level the training is at um, yeah uh, but that's not not the way you're talking about Okay. But I can add it in and make a little note. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking it might be because obviously the view that you're taking, if I'm like, if you're in the shoes of the user, um, you're learning these skills, but even if you've got the skills, if you're not putting the right words in, your, your CV could be completely missed. It could be. Um, that's if you're relying on recruiters finding you you should be able to go out and hunt for these things. Um, and that's where yeah. there's a certain amount of, of experience comes in. You should be able to get your CV out there and it should auto pick up on stuff. I find it's normally yeah. when you get the, um, we, if, if you were to have the idea, oh, I'm using my pen again, if you get the idea of, a, was it a Venn diagram? Yeah. So if you've got dev skills and finance skills, that'll pick up on, on a bank's, search if you just say i'm a dev you'll never pick up but if you're if there's a thousand devs in the search and there are only five of them that are dev with finance experience they'll find you yeah 
So you need to make sure, um, see, I mean, I went down the route of being a dev and a trainer. So I get picked up in searches for uh, tech companies that want trainers. Because um, a lot of devs don't write down they're happy doing talks and training. So I get found. But, right, um, okay, yeah. But you could be uh, you could be a dev uh, in the travel industry. You could be a dev in in you know just in, in for medical and NHS. And then anyone that's doing a search for those particular verticals, you will get highlighted. And you can get really specific if you start adding in that is you've got three verticals. Then you narrow yourself yeah. down to the handful of a people very specific. Can do it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I, I thought I'd ask. Um, so that would be my recommendation, but it's not built into the tool. That's just a bit of experience. Okay. Uh, anyone else? It's not really a question, but it's good to see the skill grading thing on the site because I'm rubbish at grading my own skills. <laughs> the, whole, the whole imposter syndrome thing kind of is good to have that, that kind of guidance. Yeah, and that's where I found I just recently did this with my team as well. And where some people would put them as a one, I actually put them as a three. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and I mean, we did it for, um, uh, I won't say his name, but he probably won't mind. There's nothing wrong with this. But he, we were doing personal skills as well, nothing related with the business. Um, and he was talking about, he does uh, um, cycling. And he was, he was talking about cycling 30 or 40 kilometers at a time and stuff for fun. But he was only putting himself at a one. I'm like, no, that's way above me. Let's put that as a three. Yeah. Um, and it's sometimes one of those things that when you're heavily into something, you realize how much you don't know. But compared with everybody else, you're an expert. But I sometimes I'm confused. So if we don't grade it, who does? Is it the system figures that out? No, no, you grade yourself. Right, okay. Yeah, I think you grade yourself. But yeah, I was going to say, I probably do a terrible job of that. So it's good yeah, to kind of. <laughs> Be able to read those descriptions and judge. So this is this is a tool I essentially built as a tool to help me, and I've added more to it over time. So I mean, it's still useful. You know, it'd be like using um, Word or Excel. Yeah. Just because you've got it doesn't mean you're great at CVs or great at doing invoicing or spreadsheets. So um, there's an element of this is a platform available, but if you've got experience in training or teaching, then it would be really useful. You can add to it. Yeah. With your own knowledge. Hmm. Uh, any other comments, questions, anything? Silence. Cool. Oh, okay, I think that means we're done. Um, okay, right, well in that case, guys, um, yes, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, first off, I wanna say a huge thank you, obviously, to Jonathan Haddock and Raymond Colstock. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, and yeah, another big wrap thank you to Ray. Thank you so much for getting suggesting this and setting it all up thank you um it's been really it's been so much fun my pleasure um obviously thanks to everyone for logging in um and oh yeah so uh this is the next event um the gold banking contacted me this morning to say that basically they've closed for the next we don't know how long but the next event isn't on um so uh, i don't know if anyone's seen but i am gonna do it on, again on zoom um, so it's still going to be the same speakers, uh, be probably rough, roughly around the same time. So we start get people logging in about 20 past, 25 past, start half past. Um, I'll be putting the link up on probably Twitter and the meetup page again. Uh, but yeah, we pretty much like this, just with different people. <laughs> so our talks will be on the 1st of April and it will be uh, Return the Carriage, Feed the Line by Aaron Taylor. And what's it like a microservice focused project from an inexperienced team by Karen Scott? Uh, as always, if anyone's interested in giving a talk, please get in contact with me. Uh, if not, I will look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank That's you. really helpful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Jonathan. Cheers, guys. Yeah.